Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello and welcome back to NanoHub U's course and introduction to bioelectricity. We are in week four and we are going to cover in this lecture 4.3, the derivation of the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. So in 4.1, we talked about Hodgkin and Huxley and the world uh, in which they lived and where they came from, uh, the intellectual environment in which they grew up, so to speak. In lecture 4.2, we looked at the core conductor equation and the cable equation, their deficiencies, and came up with an equivalent circuit that we hope will compensate for active changes in the membrane conductance and give us a new and better equation. And that equation is what we're going to derive here. But before we get to the equation, let's go back to that model. So we have a model. And this is an equivalent circuit. The membrane is not made up of capacitors and resistors and batteries. It's an equivalent circuit, which an electrical circuit, which we hope will describe membrane behavior. And so the test of this model, the test of any model, really, is first of all, does it describe, does it accurately reproduce what we know to be true? But that's not a very interesting model, I and mean, that's quite an achievement. It's hard to do, but if you build a model that tells you what you already know to be true, well, then you've done a lot of work, and really, what have you achieved? You already knew it to be true, right? For a model to actually have value in the scientific community, it has to tell you things that you don't know to be true. That's the real bar, and it's a bar that models very seldom pass. So you often hear about models of this and models of that, and people will write a program that models this behavior or that behavior, but then when you give the model an unexpected stimulus, it behaves in some way that then when you go and observe that same phenomenon in the physical world, doesn't match your model. And then you can tweak your model so that your model goes back to accounting for all the things that you've observed, but, but at this point you're really just it's an exercise in just model building. It doesn't actually achieve anything interesting. When you get something interesting is when you have a model that, pre that predicts what you know to be true. And then you can start playing with the stimulus parameters that you feed that model, and you find that it, it kicks back predictions that are interesting and unobserved, which you can then say, well, that's really interesting. Let's go and test that in the laboratory. And when you test that in the laboratory, you find that, in fact, the real world, the physical world, behaves the way your model predicted that it would. And that's when you know that the model that you have is, is, a, is an exceptional model. And this is an exceptional model. And we'll talk about, in lectures 4.4 and 4.5, the predictions that came from this model that were borne out by observation in the physical world. But before that, let's dive a little deeper into the model itself. So let's find the branch currents. So we have a membrane current, density, J sub m, and recall that the membrane current, I sub m, is related to the membrane current per unit length, K sub m, which is the membrane current, I sub m, divided by the length, which is also related to the membrane current density, J sub m, which is the current flowing out of the surface. So it's I sub m divided by the surface area, which is 2 pi, two pi a, where a is the radius, times the length L. Uh, so you can relate all these current densities together, and the current density, J sub m, is equal to the sum of the currents leaving the node. So we can use Kirchhoff's current law to equate the total membrane current to the branch currents, and initially we can start off by finding those branch currents. So the current flowing through a capacitor is, by definition, equal to the voltage across that capacitor, the derivative of that voltage with respect to time, multiply times the capacitance value. So J sub C is equal to C sub M, the membrane capacitance, times the first derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time, where this membrane capacitance is per surface volume. So we're still in units of current density. J sub K plus, the, the current through the branch that carries the potassium ions, that has the conductor for potassium and the resting membrane potential for potassium, VK, is equal to the voltage drop across that conductor multiplied times the conductance, right? From Ohm's law, so the voltage drop is going to equal Vm, which is the total membrane voltage drop, minus V sub k, the voltage drop uh, from the resting potential, and that's going to give you the drop across this conductor. And so you have what's called a, a driving force, Vm minus Vk, multiplied times a gating force, this conductor, GK. Uh, 
and that's the membrane current for potassium. Similarly, we have a current for sodium, which is equal to the gating force GNA multiplied times the driving force Vm minus Vna, and we have a leakage term, which is the GL, the conductance of these, uh, to account for these leakage of ions multiplied times Vm minus VL. So we have the branch currents for all four of the branches for our equivalent circuit. And so we can do Kirchhoff's current law at node one and find that the membrane current density J sub M is equal to the sum of the currents in each of the four branches. J sub C plus J sub K plus J sub NA plus J sub L. And then we can substitute in the branch currents to find that the membrane current density J sub M is equal to C sub M, the membrane capacitance, times the first derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time, plus G sub K, the conductance of potassium, times Vm minus V sub K, the resting potential for potassium, plus GNA, the conductance of sodium, times Vm minus VNA, the resting potential for sodium, plus G sub L, times Vm minus VL, where VL is the resting potential for those leakage ions. So this is an equation describing the membrane current as a function of the membrane voltage. And if you go back to the core conductor equation from lecture 3.2, recall that we have an equation describing a relationship between the membrane voltage and K sub M, the membrane current per unit length. And we said at the time that we had one equation with two unknowns. And to solve this, we needed a second equation with the same two unknowns. So we can convert the membrane current equation for the cable model that we derived in the last slide from K sub M to J sub M, or more aptly, from J sub M to K sub M, by noting that the relationship between membrane current density and current per unit length is that current per unit length is equal to 2 pi times A, the radius of the cylindrical structure we're looking at, multiplied times the current density. Setting Ke, the applied electrode current, to zero, the core conductor equation then becomes 1 over 2 pi A times Ro plus Rn times the second derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to distance is equal to the membrane current J sub M, which we can substitute in from Hodgkin-Huxley to say that 1 over 2 pi times the radius times the sum of the resistance per unit length outside and inside the cell, this is a constant, multiplied times the second partial derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to distance is equal to the membrane capacitance times the first derivative, partial derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time, plus the conductance of potassium times Vm minus Vk, the resting potential of potassium, plus the conductance of sodium times Vm minus Vna, the resting potential for sodium, plus GL, the conductance of the leakage ions, times Vm minus Vl, where Vl is the resting potential for those leakage ions. And this is the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. And unlike the cable equation, the Hodgkin-Huxley equation accounts for changes in membrane permeability, because recall from our last lecture, these terms, Gk, the conductance of potassium, Gna, the conductance of sodium, are not constants. They are now functions, and they are functions of the membrane voltage, which is itself a function of temperature, and also a function of time. Okay, so neglecting GL, the leakage term, and applying voltage and patch clamps, we can cancel out the second derivative with respect to distance and the first derivative with respect to time, and we can isolate GK as a function of the membrane voltage and time, as being equal to gk bar, a constant, times n to the fourth, where n is a function of the membrane voltage and time, and it's of the form x at infinity minus, in parentheses, x infinity minus x naught, e to the minus t over tau. And similarly, gna, a function of vm and time, is equal to gna bar, a constant of this form, multiplied times m cubed, sorry, the constant, multiplied times m cubed h, where m and h, like n, are of this form. And then experimentally, using patch, uh, patch clamping and using ion channel blockers and so on, we can find the values for x. So if x takes this form, where the variable here is tau, and tau 
sub k is of the form 1 over alpha k plus beta k, where alpha k and beta k are both functions of the membrane voltage, we can actually experimentally find that alpha sub k, so alpha for potassium, is equal to minus 0 0.01 times Vm plus 50 divided by exponent e to the minus 0 0.1 Vm plus 50 plus 1. And beta sub k is equal to 0 0.125 e to the minus 0 0.0125 Vm plus 60. And g sub k is 36 millisiemens per centimeter squared. So these values you can then plug in to tau, to x, and then into n. You take n to the fourth power, and you multiply it times gk bar, and you have gk as a function, excuse me, of the membrane voltage and time. And similarly, you can find tau for sodium as a ratio of 1 over alpha for sodium and beta for sodium. Well, alpha and beta for sodium are both functions of the membrane voltage, and they will have forms similar but not the same as this. Again, recall from our last lecture, this equation is not meant to be intuitive. This is not meant to be an equation or a series of equations that you look at and you say, okay, I understand what's going on here and how this represents the physical observation of the membrane voltage. This, rather, is a curve fit of measured values to an equation that reflects those values. Substituting that back into the Hodgkin-Huxley, we have the 1 over 2 pi ARO plus RN times the second derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to distance is equal to now the membrane capacitance times the first partial derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time plus gk bar n to the fourth times the gaining force Vm minus Vk, where Vk is the resting potential of potassium, plus gna bar, a constant, m cubed h, where both m and h are of that form, like n of x, multiplied times the gating force Vm minus, uh, minus Vna, or the driving force, sorry, Vm minus Vna, where Vna is the resting potential for sodium, plus Gl times Vm minus Vl. Now, if the membrane voltage represents a wave traveling at a constant velocity, and this is a reasonable assumption, because we expect that an action potential traveling down an axon will be moving at a constant velocity at any point or between any two points along that axon, and we can experimentally verify that that is approximately correct. If that's true, then just as we did before with the cable equation with a time-dependent solution, we can equate the, a relationship, we can create a relationship between the second derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to distance and the second derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time with 1 over the velocity squared, where the velocity is constant, out front, and that allows us to convert the partial differential equation that we currently have for Hodgkin-Huxley into an ordinary differential equation where all of the derivative terms are taken with respect to a single variable, and that makes it much easier to solve. And so that equation would be 1 over the velocity squared, where that's a constant, times 2 pi ARO plus RN, all of this is a constant, times the second derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time, not distance, is equal to C sub M times the first derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time, plus these combinations of gating and driving forces. So we now have an ordinary different second order differential equation which we cannot solve analytically. So when you learn how to solve equations in differential equations, you have an equation and then you obtain what's called an analytical solution. That is a solution for which you can plug in any value of x and get a corresponding value of y. But not all differential equations have analytical solutions or analytical solutions that are reasonable to find. And the Hodgkin-Huxley is an example of one that does not have an analytical solution. So to solve Hodgkin-Huxley, what we do is instead of trying to solve for any point in time of an action potential, we solve at discrete points in time, and we pick the distance, we'll call it h, the distance h between points such that the number of points for which we solve allows us to look at the solution and predict what the value is between points. So we solve at enough points that we can look at this curve and recognize the shape of the continuous time solution. But it's important to know that we don't in fact have the continuous time solution. So this Hodgkin-Huxley equation using a numerical method, which we will not cover in this class, but I encourage you to learn in a separate course, using a numerical method allows you to solve Hodgkin-Huxley 
in time, the membrane voltage as a function of time, at discrete values of time. And we hope, if you pick your time interval well, that th that will be sufficiently equivalent to what is really going on in the neuron, that it allow you to make some interesting predictions. So having solved it, and having solved it numerically, we find that there are now four regions of interest in an action potential. And we're going to try to equate these regions of interest to what is going on in our Hodgkin-Huxley equation to see if this whole thing comes together and makes sense. So in a typical action potential, you have four regions of interest. One is everything that happens before you hit a threshold voltage. So at that point, you're flowing passively. You have excitatory postsynaptic potentials, you have inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, they're traveling down dendrites, they're summing up in the cell, in the soma, the cell body, specifically at the axon hillock, the base from which the axon protrudes from the uh, main body of the neuron, and there you're making a determination about whether or not to initiate or not initiate an action potential. Everything that happens right up until that point in which you cross that threshold and give yourself an action potential, that is region one. In region two, you cross the threshold, the sodium ion channels open, the potassium ion channels close, and the membrane voltage begins to rise. The membrane depolarizes, it depolarizes all the way up across zero, and then repolarizes up to 20 millivolts, more or less. And then the, the sodium ion channels begin to close, the potassium ion channels, which have already begun to open, begin to dominate, and the potassium current flowing out of the cell overtakes the sodium current flowing into the cell, and the cell membrane begins to drop back down, crosses zero, begins to hyperpolarize all the way down to minus 65 millivolts, the resting membrane potential. That's region three. And finally, in region four, you have an excessive hyperpolarization, so you go past the resting membrane potential for potassium, and you come back up to that resting membrane potential for potassium. So you have that undershoot, and that undershoot phase, followed by the equilibrium phase, that's region four, which blends into region one, after which the next action potential will begin. So if you look back at our Hodgkin-Huxley equation, you find that there's, you can break up the current into the capacitive components, and the capacitive current, current is going to change only slowly and not measurably here. And then you have the gating, uh, the leakage terms, which we're going to leave out. And so we're going to look at just the potassium current and the sodium current. And you can measure those both independently, shown here, the sodium current in red and the potassium current in yellow. You can see that region one corresponds, again, to that point at which there really isn't a transmembrane current. It's mostly capacitive current. Region two is where the sodium current peaks and takes over. Region three begins where the sodium current begins to drop off as the sodium ion channels close, the potassium current begins to really take off, and really when those two are equal to each other, and you cross again um, the, the zero current, net current point, and then takes you all the way until you repolarize the neuron. And then there's this portion at which you still have a potassium outflow which hyperpolarizes the current intermittently before you restore the resting membrane potential. And the Hodgkin-Huxley equation, these regions correspond to behaviors observed in equations, in equations M and H, which are tied to the sodium current, and N, which is tied to the potassium current. So in region one, the excitatory postsynaptic potential discharges the capacitive uh, uh, for the membrane, depolarizing V sub M. In region two, M for sodium, goes up rapidly, H drops slowly, but because the sodium current is proportional to M cubed H, and the M growth is much greater than the H drop, the net change in sodium current is positive. And the potassium current N increases, but increases only slightly. So the potassium ion channels begin to close, but as the membrane begins to depolarize, the resting potential moves away, so the sodium wants to flow more quickly, even though the ion channels are closing. That's what this is describing. In region three, the M value decreases rapidly, 
each value increases slowly, so the net effect is that the sodium ion chain or the ion current drops and the potassium ion current continues to increase, now overtaking the sodium current. And then finally in region 4, M and N go away and all that you have left is a small h value which accounts for the hyperpolarization. So you can map these values and their behavior to the ionic currents that you observe and to the membrane voltage that you see. And everything matches up quite nicely. Now what we'll try to do is we're going to try to begin to apply unknown stimuli or new stimuli to this model and see how it behaves and see what sorts of predictions we can make based on that behavior. And that's where we'll begin in the next lecture. I'll see you then.